Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video where today's case is going to be focused on the death of DJ Ficky. He died in October 2016 and the Walker County Sheriff's Office said that his death was ruled a suicide by shotgun but DJ's family are demanding answers. They're sure that he was actually murdered. I was contacted by DJ's sister Amanda who's trying to get as much media attention as she can on this case in an attempt to get answers as to what happened to her brother. It's been an uphill battle for her and her family it seems since the events of October 2016. DJ Ficky was born Donald Edward Ficky Jr, DJ being his nickname, on the 14th of November 1988 in Chickamauga, Walker County, Georgia, USA. He would be a lifelong resident of Chickamauga, or Chickamauga, I'm sorry, not sure how it's pronounced, where he was a member of the Oakwood Baptist Church and an avid University of Tennessee fan. He was also the only boy with three sisters, so in his family it was kind of a case of DJ and his father Donald, his namesake, against the world. The two were incredibly, incredibly close, and when Donald ended up dying when DJ was just 14, it really affected him. Amanda says that DJ never really got over his father's death. But despite this, she describes her brother as the kind of person who never met a stranger. He could walk into any room and chat to anyone. He was everyone's friend all the time. Now, I can already predict there's going to be a lot of judgement in the comments section surrounding this case. DJ wasn't a perfect person. He, without a doubt, had his issues. I mean, who really is perfect? But when you're hearing about this case, I would like you to try and put your judgments to one side and just listen to the facts when making your mind up as to what happened here. Everyone makes mistakes. Some people make more than others. It doesn't mean they deserve to be potentially murdered. Nothing DJ did in his short life justified murder. So DJ first met his wife Brandy through school but they didn't end up getting together until a few years later. They ended up marrying in 2014 and together they would have three children, a son and twin girls. DJ loved being a dad, having children came really naturally to him and even when he found out that Brandy was expecting twins, he was on cloud nine. Amanda says that he was a really great father and he always knew exactly what to do. But DJ's life wasn't always easy because he did have a substance abuse problem, he had a drug addiction. Amanda says that she believes her brother never had a huge drug problem, she describes him as a social drug user, that he would just be inclined to use whenever he was around other people who were using. Apparently the problem would get worse though when Brandy was around, who also struggled with her own substance abuse issues. The two weren't the best influence on each other, and sometimes DJ's mother would have to step in to take care of the children. But DJ became determined to turn his life around, and he actually ended up going to rehab, which really did lead to a big change. Upon leaving rehab, he begins training as an MMA fighter, putting all of his energy into his training instead of into drugs. He really loved it, and he was finally doing really well in life but Brandy was continuing with her battle with drug abuse and it put a strain on their marriage. As you can probably imagine, it wasn't easy for DJ to stay clean whilst Brandy, his wife, was still using. The two would argue a lot and Brandy would often leave DJ to go and stay with a man that DJ's family refer to only as the roommate. I can only assume that he can't be named on a public platform for legal reasons. The roommate was a man that Brandy and DJ had met through a friend of a friend and Brandy would often go and stay with the roommate because he would supply her with drugs. As you would guess, DJ and the roommate did not get along but DJ was always begging Brandy to come back home. Although their relationship was undeniably tumultuous, probably very unhealthy for both of them, they loved each other at the end of the day and they loved their children. Soon it became clear that Brandy was having an affair with the roommate, which didn't help with the already high tensions between him and DJ. I mean, any husband probably wouldn't much like the man his wife is sleeping with. Despite the affair, DJ wanted to make things work though with Brandy and would often go and visit the house where she was now living with the roommate. On multiple occasions there were physical fights between the two men. The roommate on one occasion ended up holding a knife to DJ's throat and on another occasion beat him with a golf club and DJ fought back with the bat. Most men would probably give up on trying to get their wife back by a certain point but as Amanda says DJ was incredibly loyal towards his wife. He didn't want to give up on her and their marriage. And it all came to a head on the 3rd of October 2016. A couple of days before that, DJ and Brandy had actually officially got back together and DJ was apparently over the moon. He'd even called home to let his family know the news and he was undeniably happy about it. 
On the day in question, DJ and Brandy have been staying at a house in Flintstone, Georgia, that is owned by a man known only as the Old Man. Another person I'm assuming can't be named for legal reasons. A lot of sources tend to refer to this house as something akin to a drug den. People came and went as they pleased. There were no fixed residents. There were several people living there at any one time, and on the day in question, Brandy and DJ were in the home with the roommate when things took a turn for the worse. DJ's mother, Kathy, started to receive a series of urgent texts from DJ in which he was begging her to come and pick him up, saying that she has to come and save his life because him and the roommate were trying to kill each other. One text reads in block capitals, I'm going to end up dead here. Kathy was unable to come and pick him up though because she was pretty sick at the time. Her heart was only working at 20% and she'd been advised by her doctor to stay away from stressful situations. And where Brandy and DJ went, stress usually followed. I can't imagine the guilt his mother would later feel, but regardless, she was living in Alabama at the time, about 45 minutes away from where DJ currently was in Georgia. She would never have made in time, even if she did leave after the first text she received. The texting goes on for about 20 minutes until his mum asked him that if he came back home, was he going to go to court for child support? And DJ texts back that he would. From what I can gather at this point in time, Kathy was actually taking care of the children. DJ then goes into the other room where Brandy was doing her hair and tells her, mum is coming to get us, get your stuff together, before he goes back into the living room and sits on the sofa. And it was just three minutes after DJ sent that last text to his mum that the roommate was on the phone to 911, reporting that DJ had shot himself in the face. states the 911 operator that DJ had shot himself with a shotgun. He says, I tried to get the gun and it went off and he had it in his mouth. In the background you can hear Brandy yelling and the roommate yelling back. The call is then ended by the roommate. The operator then calls back, ringing for 21 seconds before the roommate even answers again. Oh. How old is he? How old is he? Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven? Yeah. Okay, is he still breathing? Where's the damage done to his head? It's right in his mouth. It's right in his mouth. It's inside his mouth. It's inside his mouth. 
disconnected by the roommate after just over three minutes. The third and final call is with a different operator. The previous operator's supervisor has taken over. Hello. Mike. Oh my uh, Mike. Oh my Mike, can you hear me? Yes, This This is Walker County 911, okay? 911. Yeah. Okay, Mike, listen to me, okay? I will, because I get out of here. I'm smart. Okay, Mike, Mike, I need to talk to you. Can you give me your attention? Yes, sir. Okay, the gun, where is it located now? It's in the chair with him. Okay. I, I, I got the gun up and checked to see what it was. It was a 12 gauge. Okay, so you moved the gun, is that correct? Yes. Okay, can you secure that gun? Can you uh, get it unloaded safely and, and lay it to the side out of the way? Yes, ma'am. Okay, can you do that while I'm talking to you? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'll give you just a minute, okay? I see. I told me to get the, the gun and secure it. No, don't don't shoot it. Secure it. No, don't shoot it. it. Unload it. it. Unload it. it. Listen, oh, Mike, Mike. The, are you going to be the one doing it? Ain't got, it ain't but a single shot. It looks like okay. a shot off. Okay, so there's nothing in the gun at this point, correct? No. The gun is empty, correct? No. The operator asked the roommate if he can secure the gun, unload it safely and lay it to the side out of the way. Eventually he disconnects the call once again. It's confusing that the roommate repeatedly keeps dropping this call. Once it's possibly a mistake, but three times is strange. Brandy is screaming and wailing in the background. There's just a lot going on. The first officer was dispatched at 1.12pm in what according to the official investigation report was a suicide attempt call. He arrives on scene at 1.22pm to find two people, a male and a female, outside the front of the residence waiting for him. They identify himself as a friend and the wife of the victim respectively. 
The roommate was still holding a 12 gauge shotgun shell in his hand and stated correctly that the 911 operator had told him to unload the weapon, handing the shell over to the officer. The gun itself was on a shelf near where DJ lies. He was found slumped on the living room chair with a severe wound to his face. There were no signs of life or a pulse and medical help arrived shortly after, who also couldn't find any signs of life. Brandy and the roommate spoke to other officers once they arrived on the scene. The roommate said that he'd come over to the residence to see his friend. I assume this would have referred to Brandy, but from the official report, it seems that he alludes to the friend he came to visit being DJ himself. He told investigators that DJ had been arguing with Brandy and that DJ had been real depressed and had tried to kill himself in the past month or so. He also said that he'd been in the other room when he heard the gun go off inside the living room of the trailer home. The Walker County coroner arrived on the scene shortly after. As I said, DJ was found on the sofa by the front door, sitting in an upright position, shirtless, wearing just shorts and slip-on shoes. The coroner immediately observed a large wound to the victim's face and mouth that would be consistent with a gunshot wound. There was a large amount of blood on his face, chest and stomach that all appeared to come from the same face wound. His preliminary observation told him that the gunshot wound was from left to right and the barrel of the gun was placed on the victim's left cheek just below the corner of the victim's lips. All of that could be told even before the autopsy, before a proper look at the body. It was noted that there was no suicide note and it was also noted that there was a bloody towel on top of the bin. Then a detective speaks more in depth with Brandy and the roommate at the scene. The roommate stated that he went to the trailer about midday. He needed a shower, but Brandy was in there at the time, whilst DJ was in the master bathroom at the westernmost end of the trailer. The roommate stated that DJ was using his phone to text his mother, Kathy. He said that whilst he was waiting on the shower, he went to the bedroom at the easternmost end of the trailer. He said that it was whilst he was waiting in that bedroom that he heard the gunshot. When he came out of the bedroom, he found DJ sitting there covered in blood. Brandy came running out from the other end of the trailer in hysterics and went outside, and that's when the roommate called 911. They also tried to talk to Brandy, but this was a lot more difficult because she was highly upset, and apparently she was unable to respond when they asked her what she saw. When investigators contacted Kathy, telling her about the death of her son, she almost immediately said that this was a homicide. She said that she had text messages from her son saying that he was fearing for his life just moments before he died. An in-depth investigation obviously begins, partially fueled by what Kathy said about this incident being a potential homicide. The roommate was asked if he would consent to a gunshot residue test on his hands. He consented and the samples were collected. When the detective finished collecting the samples, the roommate stated that he'd shot several firearms the day before and asked if this would taint the results on the test. He was told it would not. He then said that he tried to get the gun away from DJ shortly before the gun went off and asked if that would affect the results of the test. And again, he was told it would not. But didn't his statement just moments earlier say that he only came out of the East bedroom once he heard the gunshot go off after it had gone off? The detective did pick up on this inconsistency at the time, but didn't want to say anything as he didn't want to scare the roommate off talking. He would then go on to say that DJ did have a history of suicidal thoughts and actions and shows the detectives the text messages to Kathy on the phone. The detective writes in his report that Kathy had also advised them of the messages on the phone, but the detective didn't read them as DJ telling her that he was being threatened because the beginning of the conversation was DJ begging Kathy to come and let them live with her, but Kathy several times told him no. Honestly, I'm not sure how you can read those texts and not take it as DJ basically begging for her to come and help him because his life is feeling threatened, but apparently the detective didn't read it like that. I pretty much just summarised a whole page of the investigation report, and I was then surprised to read the next paragraph, which read, At this point of my investigation, I have no indication this incident is anything other than a suicide. Through the course of my investigation up to this point, I learned the victim's history about prior suicidal thoughts and I was made aware of heavy methamphetamine use. The wound to the victim's face could be consistent with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. No one on the scene I spoke with on that date indicated anything other than the incident was a suicide. Probably because the only person who spoke to them that day was the potential murderer. On October 4th, the detective spoke with Kathy by phone, who once again said that she felt that DJ was murdered by the roommate. She stated that she'd heard there were 10 other people in the house when the incident took place. 
She also insisted that DJ would never kill himself, which is still the thought held by his family. DJ was on the up in his life, he was excited by his MMA training, he was determined to get his life back together to care for his children. And it's also highly unusual for someone to kill themselves whilst in the presence of so many others, whether that be the 10 people that Kathy stated or just Brandy and the roommate. On October 5th, Brandy was interviewed at the Walker County Sheriff's Office. She was still visibly upset but able to talk more about the incident, but it's noted that she was jumping around in her story a lot, she wasn't making a lot of sense. She said that the night before the death, her and DJ had slept in the camper with the roommate, which is separate from the trailer. In the morning, her and DJ go up to the trailer and begin to argue. DJ asked to use the roommate's phone, which he did so while sat on the sofa while she fixed her hair in the bathroom. She stated that she came back into the living room area and saw the roommate angrily storm out of the bedroom he was in and shoot DJ in the face with a shotgun. That's Brandy's statement that she saw the roommate shoot DJ. She stated that there were two other people present in the trailer at the time who left the scene shortly after the shooting, who we will call F and T. Brandy stated that if F and T were questioned, they would actually back up the roommate story, not her, that it was a suicide, because they were such good friends. When asked why she didn't tell detectives at the scene that this was a murder, she said that she was still in shock and she was scared. And she stated that she was still too scared to contact the police afterwards for this information as well. And that the gun was approximately two to three feet away from DJ's face when he was shot. The very same day, the roommate was interviewed by detectives again. And yet again, his story changes. He said there were indeed other people in the trailer that day, F and T, who he'd known for over a year. The roommate said that he was in the bedroom when he heard F say to DJ, come to the junkyard with me, to which DJ replied, no, fuck this, she's going to talk to me. Remember, DJ and Brandy were arguing. The roommate stated that F and T leave the scene at this point. A few minutes later, he heard Brandy yelling from inside the living room and then the gunshot. But then he immediately changes his story and says that he came out of the room when he heard Brandy yell and say that DJ had a gun in his mouth. He goes up to DJ and apparently tells him not to do this and to give him the gun. He can't remember if he touched the gun or not or just put his hands up so DJ couldn't hit him with it. He told DJ not to shoot the gun as it goes off. He remembers Brandy saying, why did you shoot him? Then he calls 911 and we know how that conversation went. He said that he couldn't really remember the events of that day very well and he also said that him, Brandy and DJ would often use methamphetamines together. Now I don't want you to think that I'm purposefully trying to make the roommate look unnecessarily suspicious here. I'm not trying to sway the story in any way. Pretty much all of what I've just told you comes directly from the police investigation report into this case, either summarised or verbatim. It's also worth me saying here that multiple people interviewed by the police did say that DJ had been suicidal in the past. An interview with somebody called C, who I think from context I can assume is the old man who owned the trailer, stated that Brandy and DJ's children had been taken away from them in the past because DJ had attempted suicide by a drug overdose and Brandy had tried to hang herself. DJ's family have stated over and over again though that at the time of his death he was in a good place, he was not expressing any suicidal ideology. So now let's take a look at the autopsy, which was a limited examination performed at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation on the morning of the 5th of October 2016. Starting with the toxicology report, he's found negative for barbiturates, benzodiazepams, cocaine and common opioids. He was found positive for amphetamine, methamphetamine and THC, which is the main psychoactive compound in marijuana. This does not necessarily mean that he was using drugs on the day he died, but it does suggest that he'd been using them recently. The external examination found that his body was in pretty normal condition, as expected for a 27-year-old man, except, of course, for the gunshot wound in his head, noted as an intraoral gunshot wound. It states, on the left side of the tongue, located approximately five inches below the top of the head and approximately one inch to the left of the anterior midline, was an extensively lacerated shotgun entrance wound with soot covering the left aspect of the tongue and palate. The bullet injured the tongue, hard palate, soft palate, middle basilar skull and the inferior right temporal lobe of the brain. The bullet entered from the left side of his mouth with the exit wound being the right side of the head. The wound path was front to back, left to right and slightly downwards. In the opinion of the medical examiner, Donald Fickey died of an intraoral gunshot wound. As per investigation, Donald was last heard expressing suicidal ideations. His friend then heard a popping sound and saw Donald with a shotgun in his mouth. The wadding and projectile pellets were recovered. 
Based on information available at this time, the manner of death is certified suicide. Which is interesting because the cause of death was clearly a gunshot wound. There's no debate whatsoever about that. But the reason it was ruled a suicide seems to be purely down to what the witnesses at the scene had told the officers, who had then passed this information onto the medical examiner. The coroner told the medical examiner before the autopsy that this was a suicide, so the medical examiner may have gone in with a preconceived idea. He was also told that the gun had been removed from DJ's hand by the first attending officer, which as we know was false. The gun was found on the side where the roommate had placed it after removing it from DJ himself. We also know that DJ was right-handed. Whilst it's not impossible of course, it would be very unnatural for him to pick up a gun with his right hand and then shoot it at his face left to right. For me as a right-handed person trying to replicate the movement now, I can tell you it feels very uncomfortable and entirely unnatural, it's just a weird twist. It would be a lot more instinctual to shoot right to left. Unless, of course, he shot with his left hand, but I'm assuming he probably did not. We don't know this for sure, though, because a gunshot residue test was never administered on DJ. On the 10th of October, the roommate was interviewed once again. On this day, he agreed to take a stipulated polygraph test regarding his knowledge or involvement in DJ's death, which was administered by Captain David Scroggins. Now we all know by this point the polygraph tests hold very little weight. They're designed to pick up on changes in heart rate, blood pressure, respiration and skin conductivity. The idea is that if somebody is lying they get uncomfortable and their body basically gives it away. But there can be issues with polygraphs for many reasons. Most people called in for a polygraph test are probably going to be nervous, whether they're guilty or not. Or if a guilty person is exceptionally good at lying or believes they did the right thing, their body might not give them away. In most cases, polygraph test results are considered so unreliable that they're considered inadmissible in court. Honestly, I think now they're mostly used to put pressure on a suspect instead of expected to give actual accurate results. There is a science behind it, but there are so many variables. The roommate showed deception on two questions in the test. One, did you shoot DJ? And two, did you point the gun at DJ? Once again, he was interviewed and once again, he changes his story. It's noted in the investigation report that in this new interview, the roommate said that he now knew where DJ got the gun from. He stated that DJ retrieved the gun from inside the couch cushion. He also stated that he had two hands on the gun during the struggle and he was trying to put the web of his hand between the hammer and the primer so the gun wouldn't go off. He said he knew for a fact that DJ cocked the hammer on the gun during the struggle and he also knew that Brandy pulling his arm is what made the gun go off. It's also worth saying at this point that the shotgun used to kill DJ, whether by murder or suicide, was the roommate's own gun. He'd been seen with it just the day before. And the roommate also later failed a reenactment of how the shooting occurred. So firstly, he says that he was in the bedroom and only came out once he heard the gun go off. Secondly, he said that he came out once he heard Brandy shouting about a gun and witnessed DJ shooting himself. Now he's saying there was a struggle and that he was trying to get the gun off DJ and that's when the gun went off because Brandy pulled his arm and he maybe accidentally pulled the trigger. I'm not too sure. After all of this, the Walker County Sheriff's Office did actually change the cause of death to possible homicide. But despite this, the DA refused to change the medical examiner's ruling that this was a suicide. The examiner even apparently said that there was no way the shooting happened the way the person of interest, the roommate, described it. On the 10th of March 2017, the case was turned over to the district attorney Herbert Buzz Franklin's office for review. The investigation report writes, at this time the case will be listed as cleared, turned over to prosecutor's office. Only of course, on the 4th of April 2017, the DA writes back, after a review of the evidence gathered in your thorough investigation into the death of Donald Fickey Jr, which occurred on October 3rd, 2016 in Walker County, it appears there is insufficient evidence to bring criminal charges to bear against anyone in connection with this death. While certain statements made by witnesses when viewed in isolation would tend to indicate a homicide, the physical evidence and the other witness statements support the conclusion that this death was a suicide. As the weight of the evidence supports the conclusion that this death was a suicide, this matter will be considered closed. In the unlikely event that any further evidence comes to light, please do not hesitate to contact this office. On the 16th of June 2017, the case was officially closed due to there being no other leads. It's noted that if new information is brought forward, the case can be reopened for further investigation. The investigation into DJ's death was compromised from the first moment that the 911 operator instructed the roommate to move the weapon in order to secure it, messing with the crime scene. 
From then on, it just continues to go downhill. The medical examiner didn't have all of the facts when she ruled this case a suicide. There wasn't enough communication. DJ's family have hired a private investigator, Eric Eccles, who's pushed this case to be reopened. He said to popyourcrime.com, the medical examiner did not have all the facts when she ruled it a suicide. In fact, she did not know the detective stated the case changed from suicide to homicide. The detective nor medical examiner never had any contact with each other. Then after meeting with me, they ran toxicology and found meth in his system and stated because of that, it was a suicide because meth is a stimulant and DJ could have defended himself. But there was also marijuana found in his system, which is a depressant, and the medical examiner never commented on that. He also says that gunshot residue tests were never done to determine if DJ ever fired a gun, and the gun was never forensically tested in any way, for fingerprints or blood spatter. The gun is just sitting in evidence at Walker County, untested. Eric has said there have been countless number of mistakes in this investigation that led to this injustice. So why do we think this case was never taken seriously as a murder? I think DJ's past has something to do with it for sure. He had substance abuse problems, he may have been suicidal in the past. He was found in what can only be described by locals as a drug den. Did the police simply not care about getting justice for a man that they deemed as a drug addict? Why would they take the word of the roommate over Brandy who said that she saw DJ get murdered? It seems like there is a huge bureaucratic issue here. The detectives and the coroner never had any contact with the medical examiner to make her aware of the changes and updates in this case. The medical examiner was only aware that DJ was found with a gun in his hand and that witnesses had seen him shoot. This led to the cause of manner of death being written in stone with no one being willing to correct the mistake. Amanda says that she's had a huge lack of communication from the sheriff's office, that they won't give them any more answers and they've essentially frozen her out. She is determined to get answers for DJ's three children who've been left behind without a dad. The family are currently trying to get the Georgia Bureau of Investigation to reopen the case, but they're not having much luck. Anyone who takes five minutes to look at this case can clearly see that it doesn't make much sense for it to have been ruled a suicide. Reading the investigation report is very eye-opening, it's full of contradictory interviews and obvious lies, but then at the end it's simply closed off and ruled a suicide. It's very jarring to read. His family are trying to get as much media attention on DJ's case as possible in an attempt to get the state of Georgia to reopen his case. They are asking for the state to present the case in front of a grand jury and let them decide if an arrest or indictment should or could be made. In the description box below, I'm going to leave a link to a change.org petition that you can sign to demand the state to reopen the case and a GoFundMe fundraiser to help the family cover the costs of private investigators and experts, which they've paid for out of their own pockets. Just because DJ didn't live the most law-abiding life, just because he had an addiction, it doesn't mean that he deserved what happened to him. It doesn't mean that he deserved to be potentially murdered. His case was never investigated or looked into properly. There are still so many questions surrounding it. As always, all of the sources will be linked below. If you want to go have a read of the autopsy report or the investigation reports, it'll all be there for you to have a look at with your own eyes. And also make sure you do sign that petition if you think there's been any sort of injustice here. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.